this is my big bandsaw. I consider this one of the best uh, time savers and efficiency things that I've bought to go along with my shop. It's made for resawing. I can cut 16 inches high, which is about at the biggest size bowl blanks that I'll turn normally. It has a four and a half horsepower motor on it, great big old horking thing down there. It'll cut through thick lumber all day long. It's made for heavy duty use and abuse. Uh, it gets the blanks with parallel sides. I mean, if I'm cutting with a chainsaw, if I'm plus or minus an inch, that's doing pretty good, uh, even on a good day for me. This gets it down to plus or minus maybe an eighth of an inch, what that means. Makes it a lot easier to cut out rounds on my small bandsaw and I can start turning at higher speeds. There's less waste to remove. Um, just a wonderful efficiency tool. Now this bandsaw blade, teeth are very wide. I'm lucky to have a bandsaw blade maker here in town and I went down to him when I got my first bandsaw and told him what I was doing and he outfitted me with the best bandsaw blades for what I was doing. I prefer the bimetal blades. Now what bimetal means is this part is a softer metal and the teeth are a harder metal and they bond those two together and then the teeth are cut out of that harder metal so it just cuts longer. If you hit a nail with this you're not going to ruin the blade. You will dull it a little bit. Um, it just saves time, saves money and this is, this is made. It's not going to give you a pretty cut. It'll give you a good cut for resawing. And I was thinking about a carbide tip blade and he said nah you don't want carbide tip blades unless you're cutting fine veneers, which I don't, and I had to try one out anyway, and it cost me about 180 bucks, and found out that, well, yeah, it works way better for veneers than it does for cutting through logs, and it doesn't really stay sharp any longer than these. Um, if you want to get them sharpened again, it's generally not much of a problem. Some guys will do them themselves. They have fancy little Dremel attachments. Uh, some guys use card files. I don't worry about it. I keep five, six of these blades on hand. I'll get four or five of them dull. Take them down to the local saw shop uh, with some of my small blades and it cost me about 30 bucks to get uh, five, six, seven blades sharpened which is, and they do it faster, way faster than I can do it and they do a way better job. But you know the bimetal blades definitely for this type of sawing work best. When you're cutting you need your bandsaw properly tuned up. Um, it's a high efficiency tool. There are a number of books out there to tell you how to do this perfectly and they are well worth the investment. Number one important thing on these are the bearings which guide the blade. So we zoom in on this one. This is called your thrust bearing. So basically when you're under cutting loads this keeps the blade from bending backwards. This particular one is a ceramic material. Goes in. You want it just barely touching the back of the blade. Tighten it up. It does help to check this from time to time just to make sure that it doesn't loosen. Because if it does loosen the blade starts bending like this while you're cutting and that makes the back side of the blade bend and crack. Uh, it can be pretty spectacular when those break. There's another set of them down underneath the saw. They work the same way. Another important thing too when you're cutting, if your piece of wood is this high you want your blade guide about right here. Again, that just keeps extra stress from being added to the blade because if you have it up way high, it's going to want to bend and flex some more. Okay, these are my side bearings. They're actually not bearings, these are blade guides. And these are made out of a ceramic material. Uh, some of the older saws actually use lignum vitae, uh, very heavy, very oily wood. There are some synthetic type things. They keep the blade from wobbling back and forth while you're cutting. Uh, it just keeps it stable, makes your cuts a little bit cleaner. Um, these ceramic ones too, they also go the entire length of this blade so it helps keep some of the crud off of it from when you're cutting wet wood or green wood. Okay, this is one of the safety things on a bandsaw that you need to pay attention to. They are not made for cutting round pieces. You know, when I'm turning I'm talking about keeping the part of the tool that is cutting, the cutting tools, your gouges, or your scrapers directly over the tool rest. If I was to try to take this and rip a flat on that side, as soon as the teeth engage, it's going to want to twist like that. That will break your bandsaw blade. Same thing too, if you want to make a cross cut on it, it's going to want to grab into this and try to spin it into the blade as it turns. You can make a sled, a V-sled, which will hold these somewhat. Um, generally, I'll just do that with a chainsaw because I can get close enough, cut it in half, and then do like I did on these where I square up one end and then cut it the log standing on edge. You can take, if you do it with a chainsaw and cut a good sized chunk off, 
and rest it on that and cut it. That is relatively safe, but um, I just like my method of standing them on end. Uh, much more stable platform to work from, very little risk of it tipping, of the blade binding and catching, and if these blades break, especially on a saw this size, it gets pretty exciting. It doesn't do any damage to you, but it makes a lot of noise. So this is one of the downsides of standing your bowl blanks on end and cutting the same way as if you cut with a chainsaw parallel to the grain. You're going to get a lot of hairballs in it. Not a problem really. They just don't go through the dust collector very well. And that is partly because you've got all these long fibers and also I think dust collection ports on bandsaws are very poorly designed. But you have to clean out your bandsaw get those out of there. Okay, so now I'm going to take this blank here. This is actually a piece of an ornamental cherry tree from somebody's front yard and prep this for bowls. Um, I've already taken it, cut it in half with a chainsaw. If you look at this piece, I still have the center of the log in here. There's actually a little crack coming off there, so most of this will come out. This is the part that will probably look best for a regular bowl. Look at the grain on the inside. It does not follow the center. It does kind of a pattern there, but I'm not really going to worry about it. First step in prepping this after cutting it in half like this, and I did get a nice flat cut. I take it over to my big band saw, lay this down on the table and make this end square. So I can stand it on that end and then cut a parallel blank. This piece got a very funny shape to the outside. It's not symmetrical at all. Different on that side. Then on this side, the pith is again right there. So I'll probably take and take a slab off of here and maybe a couple of shallower ones rather than the deep bowl. Um, just not going to be able to get anything very big out of that one. So I want to square up this end and as I scoot this up to the blade you can see I've got that's about an inch and a half in there or so. I'm going to make a straight cut this way. Uh, mostly just to square it up. I could get fancy someday and build a sliding sled for this thing. That's one of those round to a projects that maybe someday I'll do it. Generally I can eyeball it close enough to get a good straight cut. And I will use the dust collector on this one so it'll make a little more noise than normal. Now that face is square to the blade. And I've just found this is the easiest way to cut my blank so I can get two parallel sides on it. Now I'm going to trim the other one up now too. So next step here, this is fairly straight across here. I don't have to worry about this edge. I want to get a mark over here. Uh, I might be able to go a little bit deeper than that. That's a five inch strip. This is a five and a half. Kind of minimal. I might cut inside that. So that'll get me one big bowl blank. This is parallel. The tree's not round, so that may change the bowl design a little bit. Um, center of the bowl will be about here. The grain should line up fairly close to the bottom. But um, I'll know more about that by the time I'm done turning it. Okay, so this is my parallel line here. Stand it up on the bandsaw. I'll cut on this side. Nice little 
cathedral effect, they call that, with the wood grain. Okay, this piece, this is the very center of the log. You never want that in a bowl. You can guarantee that it will crack off if there's a crack there already. So I'm going to come into about here. I may get a few little platters off to the sides of it and then one bowl about like that. So that's about an inch and a half. I'll go two inches. Mark a nice line there. And uh, this is about four inches there. I think I can get something nice off of that and the last little piece on the end is not going to be worth messing with. Unless it was a very special piece of wood. Okay, so we have two pencil lines here. I'm going to make two cuts. This one I'll cut off the small piece first and then cut this down the middle. It just makes it a little bit more stable on the tabletop. nice pieces. Time to scribe the circle again. I like using a compass. Uh, some people do have sets of plywood or hardboard circles that they've cut out. They'll drive a nail for the center and then draw around that. Every bowl that I turn changes size from quarter to one inch or something. They're never two of them identical and I find this much easier to adjust. So I'm in about the center there. Open it up a little bit. Push in nice and deep. Scribe my line. And that one's ready for the little bandsaw. Okay, we're ready to cut the circle out of the blank here. I marked it in pen because that's easier for the camera to see. Since this was done on the bandsaw, this side is nice and flat. There's no chance of it rocking back and forth while I'm cutting, which will pinch the blade here and make it bind up. First thing I do before I start cutting, I make a relief cut here and one up here. Um, these will probably break just fine. Thing is, if you have a board and you cut out the perfect circle and you get back to the beginning again, you're still stuck inside the wood. You have to cut it out. And actually little quarter sections like this stack a lot easier in your firewood pile and inside the wood stove. So turn it on, dust collector, and then start cutting. Now this one's all ready to drill the recess and turn. Now this is a piece that has the pith in the center of it, one little crack on this side. So what I'll do with this one, I'll take it and rip it from center to center. I think I can get one decent sized bowl out of here. If I want to get excited about it, I can get a couple of small ones out of here. So maybe go ahead and mark those out and then cut it in half. Maybe two little ones out of there. Some of the guys on the wood forums were calling these little bitty ones like this ort bowls, which was supposedly for all those little end thread pieces uh, from doing needlepoint and put them in the little bowl like that to keep them from wandering all over the house. 
Maybe get another one out of here. So that's basically one layout option. Little bowl, little bowl, little bowl. I'm not going to worry about that. And that gets that center piece out of there which has the cracks in it. So now time to take it to my little bandsaw and that's where I cut the circles. Okay, I've got three little ones I'm going to cut out of this one. I'll take one cut down here, probably cut off this corner, make a cut in between these two here, maybe a relief cut or two on those. So first step, drop my blade guard down, blade guide, blade guard, to proper height. This is a blank I just cut out and generally I won't cut them out until I'm ready to turn them but since I'm doing a lot of demonstrating here for this film these are going to sit for a day or two or a week or two before I get around to turning them. You don't want it to crack you've got a lot of exposed end grain fresh green wood you can use your end grain sealers um, paint it or whatever this is something that I've discovered that works just wonderfully. This is a stretch plastic film. They use it around boxes, keep them on pallets. You can get it at your local office supply places or any kind of a shipping place. Stretch it around the rim. And I do stretch it. And this makes a very effective sealer. And I had a piece of my drone that I tested this out on once. I left that piece of my drone for Oh, six weeks thereabouts, not a crack in it, and if you're not familiar with Madrone, that's one of those woods that starts to split sometime between when you get the chainsaw out of the truck and when you fire the chainsaw up. But stretch it out, covers your end grain, pretty much seals it, prevents cracking, so this will stay longer than two or three days. If it's just going to be a day, I'll put them in a plastic bag or just throw them in the pile of shavings and it seems like there's always piles of fresh shavings, but that's just how to store a blank. Keep it for a few extra days before you get around to turning it.